Hey, welcome to episode 25 of the Rethinking Trauma and Transition podcast. And at Rethinking Trauma and Transition, we challenge the stigma surrounding trauma and the healing through our podcast. We aim to empower those who are experiencing the challenges, providing them with knowledge and language necessary to embark on a transformative journey towards a more fulfilling life. So what episode is this now, Rich? 25, Ali. I said at the beginning. Love. And also, we have a competition at the end of this podcast for the people in the United Kingdom only. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I think we're going to reflect on those four episodes that we had a chat to with Kim. Yeah. Aces. Hmm. I don't know about you, but it left me very reflective after those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most poignant things for me was throughout, just because it's called adverse, it doesn't mean it's abuse. Mm -hmm. And just because you've gone through adverse things, it doesn't necessarily mean you are not able to move on and thrive from them. What are your thoughts? Well, I suppose for me, the minute we start talking about ACEs, it's it's very tempting when you have information that's structured into different categories to almost go through those categories and ask, does it apply to me? Mm -hmm. Because in a way, that's how we process information, is almost trying it on for size to gain a level of understanding of that concept. I also think there's a good element and it's easy to finger point and blame but say the parents, caregivers, whomever has been raising that child to go, this is all your fault. Even though they were doing the, hopefully they were doing their best with the knowledge that they had and the skills and experience that they had. Well, I suppose there's different elements within the ACEs, isn't there? There are, are elements that are definitely sitting within the legal definitions of abuse. Mm -hmm. But there are also elements that are life circumstances that Very are so. often out with the control of individuals. They just happen to us. They are circumstances that are challenging, are difficult, lead to tough decisions in the moment that might be less than ideal for all concerned, but are the best possible decisions that can be made at that time. Yeah. There's also, it reminds me of, in some cases, is the road to good intentions mm. and so you may have a very very prosperous family very wealthy family and you just shower that child with all sorts of toys and everything else but actual no physical emotional love mm -hmm. or you might be in a family that shares you with emotional stability and emotional love but actually that doesn't necessarily negate the Financial constraint or financial concern that you're living within. Yeah. Or you might be in a family where the circumstances of the family unit lead to tough decisions over where the emotional support has to sit at any given time. Mm -hmm. That in an effort to maintain the family unit, sometimes the focus and all the energy has to be on keeping down two jobs, which leaves you in that really awkward situation of not having the time to invest in the emotional well-being. Well-being, uh-huh. And, and there's also, to a certain extent, is the models we build as children and how we represent the world is how our parents interact with each other. Mm -hmm. how useful and unuseful that is to each other 
and how we then grow up and develop our own relationships or lack of developing relationships with other people. That's just for me. The power in these conversations comes from the capacity that it almost opens up for reflection, hmm. for the additional information and maybe the additional understanding that we get when we are able to review that with different eyes from a different age. And I'm just conscious that sometimes one of the major issues with blame, shame and guilt is hindsight. And hindsight has a lot to answer for. Absolutely. Because with they hindsight... See, they say hindsight is twenty twenty vision, don't they? Mm. But I also think is with age comes perspective. And with that, it comes a case of beginning to forgive, which is possibly a topic we're going to chat, have a discussion with some other time. Mm -hmm. But forgiveness, forgiveness of yourself, forgiveness of maybe your parents, but not necessarily forgetting. But this, as I say, this is another subject we'll go into at a later stage. Well, I'm wondering, Rich, if but sometimes the challenge, and you and I work with the, the issue of hindsight on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. You know, the number of times that we'll probably have conversations with people we're working with where they are from a future perspective going back and judging the past, their decisions in the moment, the decisions of somebody else, the outcomes, and why did I make that decision? Because look at where I am now. Look at the outcome of that. And... When I come across that, I suppose the point I note with them is, well, actually, you're making that review with additional information that you didn't have available to you at the time. You couldn't foresee the future. You didn't know how that was going to turn out. And now in the future, you, you're looking back and going, well, look at that. Yeah. But all of that information and the residual or the rippling decisions that you've made since then lead up to that point of hindsight. But if you strip that away back to only what you knew at the time of the decision, could you honestly say you would have made anything different? Hmm. Because I don't know about you, Rich, but I don't consciously make poor decisions. I might make decisions that I know are not always in my best interest, but at that point of decision making, they will feel as if they are the only decision or the most appropriate decision I can make at the time. Definitely. And it's possibly there's less than useful, like less useful decision making process is from how we were formed, how we were brought up. And therefore, yeah, we are making those best decisions that we can in that time and space. Well, that comes back to, I suppose, the power of having these conversations. For me, is about the push to reflection. It's the mirror it holds up that allows you to review and go, actually, yeah, that is very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And if it's familiar, what impact has it had on the decisions I make as an adult? What well, impact does it have on the relationships I have as an adult? I think everybody has regrets. And with that reflection of regret is, oh, I could have done that better, I could have done this better. Mm -hmm. But with it, as you said earlier, with that information we had at the time, possibly not. Well, that point of reflection is about me acknowledging the drivers for my decision making. Mm -hmm. well, I, think I think it's how we move on. Mm. You know, um, as we begin our discussion, it's all about the reflection of our four week 
podcast with Kim. Mm -hmm. And as I said, as I said in that podcast, she's a classic example of someone who's moved on from that adversity. She's someone who's got on to thrive and survive, even though she does get triggered and she does get the odd gun, oh shit, this kind of thing's happened to me. But she's proved that people can progress, they can thrive and they can make really good adjustments to themselves to live live a more fulfilling and rewarding life, whatever that does mean to them. So is that then the benefit of understanding our past isn't about the ticks we put in the boxes for how much of that has supposedly caused us issues, but it's about recognising the drivers for our decisions now so that we can make conscious choices rather than being driven by unconscious patterns. Yes, I think so. And this partly also goes away with our podcast that we did with Cuddy. Mm -hmm. The problem is not the problem, it's the labels that we attach. Well, I'm also thinking about the one we did on, was it Boundaries, which was we were talking about that push me, pull me, and how mm. you navigate new territory. Yep. Which is, the first step of that is actually recognising what's driving that response in us so that we can actually assess and risk assess if this is still valid now. Or if we want something different. Mm -hmm. And then how do we assess? Whether that's something we do want differently. We have to know. We have to know that there's something going wrong. Or maybe not wrong. We have to recognise this that we need to do something differently. Because again, it's all about potentially it's about breaking those repeated patterns, breaking those cycles. Going, well, I've done this before, I've been here before. What can I do different? Part of that, I think, sometimes, and I'm, I suppose there are, there are a number of options there. We can recognise as a repeating pattern without knowing where it comes from and choose to adapt and change that pattern to challenge its efficiency and effectiveness for where we are or where we want to go right now. But sometimes it's really powerful when we recognise what initially drove that pattern. Because in recognising that, we can assess whether that's still valid now for us. Mm. I'll say what's driving that pattern is survival. I would say pretty much yeah, in all cases, uh, it's survival and protection. And But what protects us one day doesn't necessarily always protect us long into the future. No, indeed not. Because we ain't still walking around with clubs and spears, are we? As in the old caveman days. But we still have those same instincts. Or we're not a child. We're now an adult with different choices and different options open to us. Yep. And the impact of our choices have much more dramatic ripples in our lives than they did when we were a child. And it's where some people grew up maybe in a chaotic lifestyle and they find somebody in a relationship who's doesn't live that way they're nice and calm they're really pleasant to be around and all that sort of good mm -hmm. stuff and this person finds that really uncomfortable they have to have that chaos they have to find that disturbance that's a baseline normal mm, because that's their normal mm -hmm. But how did that how does that person then adjust from that into a more of a relaxed more of a um, balanced way of being? Well, how do we say our normal in the first place? Yeah, well, that's all the patterns and models we learn through parents, teachers, the environment around us. Or something that we experience for a sustained period of time, which becomes we become nose blind to in a way. That concept of nose blindness or sensory blindness, because we only 
process the exceptions to the rule. So if something becomes a repeated standard rule, then that becomes a baseline normal for us. So we only process the exceptions to it. So if we we live in chaos, if we live in right, surrounded by chaotic relationships, by volatile relationships, and we come across and there's only place in a situation which isn't volatile, which isn't chaotic, then that feels really, really weird because we don't know how to navigate it. Yep. But we learned how to navigate the chaos by sustaining our presence within it. Not always by choice, but the sustained presence within it allowed us to adapt and modify our behaviours until this became something we could navigate. That means that we already have the skills for changing our baseline normal. We already know how to do it. Mm. We just haven't recognised it yet. And that's done through practices such as mindfulness, meditation, breath work, cold showers, they all help to instigate that change a bit of creating a sense of self-control and maybe it's also about recognizing that i'm out of my comfort zone this feels really weird mm -hmm. uncomfortable it's uncomfortable i don't know how i how to operate here but at, the, at my core, I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll choose to stay here a little longer to see if it settles. Yeah. I'll choose to let an adjustment happen to be out of my comfort zone because my assessment of that is that actually the discomfort is the extent of the risk. Yes. And going about discomfort and risk those use of little phrases that Kim was on about is, you know, if so, when say somebody's suicidal, they're bringing up for the first time to the NAPAC line is, I can help. What do you need now? Mm -hmm. Is that non-judgmental? I'm your friend. I'm here to help. Mm. And I'll, I'm, bear, I'm here to bear witness to your testimony without judging and going, you know what? I suffered something like that. Mm. Without black catting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's about, and it's a phrase that's often used by counsellors and therapists and coaches about holding the space, mm -hmm. but it actually has a purpose. Yep. It's not so much about holding the space, but giving the space. Then that person come in. Mm -hmm. letting them stand in that space until they're comfortable enough to proceed yeah so those useful phrases again are what do you need how can I help you thank you for telling me and what happened What would you like me to do now? Mm -hmm. Or what would you like to happen next? Yeah. Because none of those have expectations that you are placing on someone else. None of those are you jumping in with solutions or decisions on somebody's behalf. All of those are empowering and space granting. And that may also be the first time that person has had the courage to tell someone. And you're the first person to have heard that. And it's also about recognising that they have a choice over how far they step into that space. Absolutely. And that's another good point that Kim brought up was... Mm -hmm. She's got a story which she's disclosed and a lot of people potentially know about what she's gone through and been through. But you don't have to divulge everything. No, you don't.
And I think that's also about not putting pressure on somebody to divulge everything, but giving mm -hmm. them the Definitely. space to know that that's, that's a conversation that can be opened multiple times, that can be... It's none of their business. No, but it's, it's also... None of someone's, someone's business, simple as that. Yeah, but it's also sometimes it's up to them to decide whether they, they share a paragraph, a sentence or a chapter. Mm. That's their choice. Yeah. And it's not up to us to push for more, but just yeah. to leave space that says the space is there if you need it, but it's your choice to make. Because simply none of our business, apart from saying thank you very much. What would you like from me? Well, I'm going to tweak none of our business a little bit. Because I agree with no. you. What I mean I... is, it's none of our business how much we delve into that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's not our choice to make. No, that's not. theirs. Mm. And all we have to do is respect their choices. Yeah. Mm. I think fundamentally for me, though, that those conversations are about the capacity to move beyond that. They are. We had a couple of um, comments. One of them was through this series, was thank you. I've, this is the first time I felt heard and felt seen. Mm. I don't know. There's someone else who I know, and because all this person has been through is too much for them, because it's really intense for that, for that person. I suppose that's the beauty of a series like this, is mm -hmm. it's there for them to dip in and out to Absolutely, when yeah. they're ready. It's there for them, just like NAPAC is, when they are ready. Yep. And there is the assurance then that hopefully what they've gained from those conversations is an understanding that there is a safe space, mm -hmm. that they can um, share that sentence, that paragraph or that chapter. And the sad thing is, we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Well, 8.5 million. Yeah. And how many million, billions of people worldwide? 8.5 million survivors of abuse in England and Wales. That's recorded. As recorded. As disclosed. Mm. And then when you open that up to the wider experience of adverse experiences, then I suppose my challenge is, is that we all at some point carry learned experiences from our childhood, learned responses. So whether or not that's within the legal definition of abuse, but is more about managing in circumstances that are less than ideal in the best way we can as a unit, as a family, as a parent, as a child. The message is the same still. The lessons we learned as a child do not have to be the ones that rule us as an adult. We retain the capacity to choose. Always. The dynamics will change as we're growing up, but we've got mm. that choice. Well, I've never been much of a fan for that phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I was like, well, it's really? that. Mm -hmm. Look at us. What are you saying, Rich? Podcast. What are you saying? You calling me old? No, I'm calling both of us. <laughs> 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 I'll have you know that I'm not a day over 21. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave that one there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. People learn things all the time, new things all the time. Mm. Well, it's always quite interesting, the conversations that you and I have doing the podcast or 
working other things together. It's kind of and much as though we probably have above average reading in these areas and above average learning in these areas, there's still moments where we're both going, whoa, can I just run this past you? Because it's like, that, that just mm -hmm. fried my head. Yep. Going back to the old dogs and your tricks. It's all about neuroplasticity. So the older we get, mm. the harder it is to change that thought process and that thinking pattern. doesn't mean it cannot change. Doesn't mean we can get better ways of thinking, better ways of behaving. Well, does it get harder to change or do we just think it does? So therefore we we are almost resistant to the idea that that capacity for change is there because we've told ourselves it's not. Well, I'm going for the less neural connections. I'm going to go for the fact that sometimes these are just the stories we tell ourselves. Mm. Potentially is, yeah, but it does. It physically hurts the brain learning new things. It don't, oh, that's too painful. I suppose it depends what we're learning. No. <laughs> <laughs> I still think we have the capacity to learn really quickly in the right set of circumstances. And sometimes, sometimes that's as simple as, well, not simple, but sometimes it's as quick as a realization from where of where something comes from in the first place. Mm. It's an acknowledgement, and that point of acknowledgement is the instigation of the change. Mm. But neurologically, rewiring that brain does take a lot of capacity and doesn't actually hurt mentally. Go, yeah, been there, done it. Mm. Mm. I suppose that that's how we experience that hurt, or whether that hurt we translate as an epiphany at a moment where we have that kind of like mind blown, head melted not really sure what to do with that and that can be an interpretation as pain or it can be an interpretation of a moment of realisation that fundamentally shifts our understanding of our experience Well that's why it's so easy to sit in front of the couch and watch you stand to Coronation Street and all that sort of stuff instead of doing something different yeah, but you might find that easy. I don't. I find that incredibly difficult because I just can't sustain the interest in it. You know, it's like five minutes. I'm not on just... myself. Uh huh. I'm more about the typical thing is East End is Coronation Street, whatever else is on the box, they go from what? Half six, seven o'clock at night till nine in the evening. What's all that trash? Yeah, but the thing is, though, for some people, that's. That's their switch off time. That's their downtime. That's what helps. That's what I'm saying. It's easier to do that than actually go and look at new activity. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of brain thought, which is made a lot of rewiring to do that. Anyway, we're going off topic. We are going off topic. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, say that. Mm -hmm. So. In summary, if you had to give your top three takeaways from the ACES episodes, what would they be? Well, so just because it's adverse doesn't define you. Forgiveness is that's in your own time if you do wish to or not. And Nate Pack is there for you when you're ready. So funny. Adverse is not always abuse. Sometimes it's as simple as the best of a bad situation. Yep. That if we understand where our patterns come from or recognize that the pattern exists in the first place, then we have the capacity to start to make decisions over whether or not this pattern serves us well or not. And that no matter what, we will 
retain the capacity to make choices about that that can create a new normal mm -hmm. for us that what we experience now does not have to be what we experience in our future that we can make changes so I don't doubt for a minute that we will probably at some point be touching base with Kim and Nipak again I'm sure we will mm -hmm. I'm very sure we will I would be very interested in everybody else's feedback on the ACEs. Yeah. See, see what they thought as well. If there were any thoughts or takeaways they had. Definitely. What people find useful, what they didn't. Uh -huh. What really resonated or what made them stop and pause for a moment. My question then is the competition. Yeah, you have a competition, don't we you? Do so what, go do. and tell us about the competition, Rich. So the question is, what does ACES stand for? What are they winning? Something phenomenally spe spectacular. Mm -hmm. What are they winning? Is it one pair of two books? <laughs> 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 Are you taking the mickey at me, Rich? Not at all. Well, we were having a bit of a semantics debate, weren't we? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I have to say that's because I have a pet hate. When people talk about two twins, I'm like, well, how many would there be three? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and what's the nature of these books, Rich? So they are both my self-published books, mm -hmm. and they're both poems. I have to admit, Rich, I do rather like your words. I think your words are rather spectacular. You can, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the question is, obviously, it's only open to people in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do they enter the competition? They obviously drop us an email, mm -hmm. DM us on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever else yeah linkedin facebook drop us up email and let us know what the first two people who do get the correct answer mm -hmm. we'll get a matching set of books absolutely so where will they find the email sure it's below sure. when they pack and oh, okay. People want to work with us. Mm -hmm. So to enter the competition, just to recap, it's tell us what ACES stands for. And you tell us by emailing us on our Ali Rich at Rethinking Trauma and Transition mm -hmm. com. Yep. Dropping us a message on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Or Facebook, or put a comment beneath. Mm -hmm. First two. First two. When's the books? When's the books? And if there's anything we've said over the last few episodes that you want to find out more about, you'd like to talk to either Rich or I, or someone at NEPAC, then again, the contact details are in the show notes. Feel free to reach out. Yep. And last but not least, if you have found this useful, please do like, share and all that good stuff. Feel free to pass on the links to your friends or your family. And yeah, share. Yep. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.